Um, greetings, hello, and welcome to this physics tutorial presented to you by O3 Schools. Now, um, O3 Schools has a gem application, which is simply um, a software you can install on your Android phone or your Windows laptop. And what it does is that once you install your software, you simply have to activate it. Now, the activation costs 2500 only, and there are several methods of payment. Simply choose the one you prefer and pay, and your software will be activated for you. Just follow the steps, and you can activate your software. Once you activate the software, then you shall gain access to everything O3 Schools Jamba has to offer. Um, there's a mock exam scenario where you can just, you know, put it on your laptop or on your desktop and you can write this exam as though you are in your jam center that day. So as you prepare, you can try to test yourself to see what you may score. Then there are other features. There are summary for novels for literature students and various other features, which you shall only be able to access once you get this app and activate it. So please do. What is this jam app will actually help you as you learn it takes you very 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 far makes your learning easy and quite fun and now with that let us get on to the topic for today all right going to be dealing with equilibrium of forces equilibrium of forces now um equilibrium of forces what we are dealing with is there's one way of dealing with solid objects there's one we'll do with liquids. Now we shall try to break it down in this class. We shall be dealing with solids. Then in subsequent video, we shall try to address equilibrium in liquids. Okay, now so to start off, what does it mean when we say a body is in equilibrium? Now, um, for a body to be in equilibrium, what we are simply stating is that the sum of all forces acting on that body is zero. That simply indicates that no force the algebraic sum of all the forces acting on that object is now zero that there's no net force acting on the body and as a result anybody in the equilibrium will actually remain in its state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line that means going to have equilibrium in two ways the body either remains stationary or moving in a straight line or we can see the body remains stationary or moving around the circle with uniform velocity. That's just what it do happens. That means the force on that body, the algebraic sum of the forces, must now be zero. Now, as we begin to analyze this equilibrium forces, we shall do it in two different regards. Number one, for what we shall consider a point body, and we shall also do it for what we shall consider a rigid body. Now, you may ask, okay, what's the difference? Now, for point bodies, we analyze that by assuming this entire object to be accredited, like to be gathered at a single point. So, that if I say this is a force acting on this object, this is a point body. Because the force is acting on it, and it seems to exist at just one single point. But for a rigid body, we actually need to have a length of that object. So, we can say, a force is acting at this point on that body and that force may be acting here and, and that force may even be acting upwards at this point so now anyone where we are trying to consider the length of the body we consider them rigid bodies why the ones where we can simply take the full body as having existing at a single point is a rigid body okay so we shall start off with point bodies now we're looking at equilibrium in a point body how do these bodies not equilibrium? Like we said, the algebraic sum of the forces must be zero. Now, if you recall, when we looked at vectors, please, if you don't look at this, please go watch that video. Now, for vectors, we introduced the concepts known as resultants. Now, we're told that a resultant is that single force which has the same effect in magnitude and direction as all the original forces acting together, implying that. If you have a point body here and one force acts on it and that force acts on it, then the resultant is that single force which has the same effect as these two forces. This is my resultant and it's going to be equal to the algebraic sum of F1 and F2. 
However, in this topic, she have been introduced to a concept known as equilibrance. Now, equilibrance is that single force which cancels out the effect of all the other forces taken together. It's that single force which can balance every other force on its own. That means um, rather than helping it out, the equilibrium in this situation will be that single force which negates all the other forces taken together. Now, if you look at this, you notice one thing. So that the equilibrium is almost the same thing. Only difference is the resultant and the equivalent, while having the same magnitude, act in opposite directions. So if my resultant is to the east, my equivalent must be to the west. If my resultant is 10 newton, my equivalent is also 10 newton. Again, almost remember if the directions become different. So that's the basic idea right now when dealing with resultant and equivalent. So, occasionally, you can solve equivalent. In the same method, you solve resultants. But more commonly, rather than using the parallelogram law of vectors, which is resultant, we prefer to now use something known as the triangle law of vectors. The triangle law of vectors is what we prefer using when solving for equilibrant. Now, you may ask, how does this work? For a triangle law of vectors, the law simply states that um, given two vectors, which can be represented by two sides of a triangle, taking another, then the third side of the triangle represents the equivalent in magnitude and direction. In find that, say I have um, one force going this way, trying to pull the object. Then um, let's call this F1. Then let's say I then have another force going um this way, if you like. F2. Then what should the equilibrium be? All you have to do is take the forces. If I take F1 now and draw F1 here. Now rather than in a, if you remember in resultant, we still have them starting from the same point and acting out. Now for equilibrium, we try to make them kind of flow out of each other such that since F1 is facing here, F2 has to be coming out. Of F1. And if I cannot put F2 here, I put F2 here, they are both sort of coming out from the same point. No. If I we want them to be flowing out all together, so my F2 will come here. So if you then notice, it's kind of like my force is flowing through. And therefore, if this is F2, then my equilibrium is simply something like this the third line that joins my shape together, but also flowing through. This is my equilibrium. So I hope the idea comes across clear. Simply, you are going to draw a triangle, but when drawing your triangle, all your forces must flow into each other. In, in resultant, if you remember, we used to do something like this, where they are all coming out from a point. In equilibrium, rather than do that, in triangle of vectors, we have the forces all flowing out. So, F1 goes this way, F2 goes this way, then the equilibrium comes this way to complete my connection. So if I have a rigid object, or rather if I have a point object, that is height of my analysis. Once I've drawn my shape, I then have to use sine rule. And if you can recall, if I call here angle A, angle B, and angle C, if I'm applying sine rule, then sine a over f2 remember sine rule is going to be the sine of the angle over the side it is facing sine a over f2 equals sine b angle over where it is facing over e equals to sine c over where it is facing f1 so any combination of any two of these or even this one going to this one helps me out to get my equilibrium and the necessary angle. So in this case, we try to use sine rule and less of cosine rule. Though at times we also use cosine rule. And that is how we solve for the equilibrium of a rigid object, of a point object, sorry.
Now, once we get to the rigid objects, um, your equilibrium formula is going to change a little bit. Now, for a rigid object, before we can analyze it, we must learn about a concept known as moment. Now, please do not confuse moment with momentum. They are very different. Moment may be defined as the turning effect of the force. If you apply force to an object in such a way that this force, rather than moving it along, tends to rotate this object, then you are not dealing with moment. For example, when applying a force to your door, because your door is hinged at one part, as you push your door open, your door is going to turn around this axis. That force you are applying, therefore, is creating a moment about that point where the door is hinged. When it's turning effect of force about a certain point. Now, that simply indicates that if this is my object, let's say it is pinned right here, right, pivot, then if I'm going to apply a force here, F1 or F, and this is the distance, the moment of this force about that point is going to be the force times S. So please note, mathematically, moment is the product of the force and its perpendicular distance from the line of action. That implies that if my force was at an angle, and then the year was theta, and we had to resolve. As far as I'm dealing with moment, I'm not going to use the horizontal component of the force, no. Instead, I will use the perpendicular component. So, when is always going to be force, times perpendicular distance, 90 degrees distance. And that is first thing to know about moment. So once we know what moment is, we will now actually want to look at these solvents of equilibrium. We must now know that equilibrium is now analyzed in two ways. Number one, for the direct sum of forces must be equal to zero. The direct sum of force equals to zero. Or in simpler ways, we simply say upward forces must be equal to downward forces. The sum of all upward forces must equal the sum of all downward forces. Then the second way, my second way of analyzing equilibrium in this situation is that the sum of all the moments, sum of moments must equal zero now this is one way of looking at it another way is when they then tell you that the sum of clockwise moments must equal the sum i'm going to put the summation here the sum of anti-clockwise moments now these clockwise and clockwise moments are simply ways to look at the rotation please keep in mind clockwise simply means it is turning the way your clock hand turns your clock hands go this way so if you have any moment that makes your body want to turn like this in a clockwise manner, clockwise manner, sorry, that is going to be a clockwise moment. But if you have a force making the object want to turn this way, opposite to the direction of the clock, that is now what we refer to as your anti-clockwise moment. So if you have a rigid object, so for it to be in equilibrium, one, some of upward forces must equal some of downward forces, and then two, the sum of all your clockwise moments also equal the sum of all your anti-clockwise moments. And if those two conditions are met, then a rigid body can be said to be in equilibrium. Now, um, there's some other things you should know. One other concept you must learn about is called the couple. Now, what's a couple? A couple is constituted of two equal and parallel forces not acting at a point. Now, what does this mean? Say I have this rigid object. If I have one force here pushing it down and another force here pushing it up, these two forces taken together constitute a couple. So there must be two equal or parallel forces acting in opposite directions but not at a point. Therefore, if they were both here, this is not a couple. For it to be a couple, there has to be a certain distance between my forces. So these two forces 
constitute a couple and um the moment of a couple is referred to as talk the talk is the moment of a couple now um your talk is simply going to be usf is f is l talk is going to be f times l though in some cases you often look at maybe a middle point here and then they call this one distance l in that case it comes f times 2l just know will be the force times the overall distance between the forces now um a good example of where your couple comes into play involves trying to turn some of your tap heads you know those tap heads that look kind of like this when you try to turn this you do not apply you do not you do not turn it with one hand you just go there and try to use one hand to turn it around no use your two hands why is that so you can apply a force at this end and an opposite force at that end so that creates the rotation so that is when the couple comes into play in your daily life so couple exists whenever you need two forces like um well these big levers or drums to open it so you have to apply one force this way and that force this way to turn that is also a couple because as this hand is turning forward it's backwards as it's turning forwards and they are not at the same point and that is basically what we need to note why solving for a couple of forces again in solid objects when you look at the equation that's where we need to look at things like um density of trust and whatnot but for now this is a equilibrium of forces for solid objects and if the formulas have been taken down and understood this time the, again for us to open our beloved O3 schools jam app so that we can actually solve some of the questions which jam has brought out on that this topic over the many years question our first question will be taken from the year 2000 question 2 the year is 2000 and the question is number 2 it states a handbag containing some load weighing 162 notings is carried by two students each holding the bag or the handle of the bag next to him if each handle is pulled 60 degrees to the vertical find the force on each student's hand now here's the deal say i have a bag here yeah? now traditionally as you are aware a bag can have more than one handle let's say there's handle here and the handle here this is a rough drawing by the way please note i have not said this but in physics we use something called free body diagram this is not very important to jam students but why students need to know how to draw this properly so again for jam students they will not look at your diagram so if you decide to do a sketch in a manner that so that you can see that's fine but for analysis we use free body diagram wherein we can present all this with points and lines such that my bag simply becomes this tiny point here. Yeah? Then my two students are each driving this bag, right? But first off, I know the bag has weight. Weight is a force going downwards. So this is my weight. 162 notings. Okay. Then these two students are each holding the handle of the bag next to him. And each handle is pulled 60 degrees to the vertical. Implying that first student driving the bag this way. And um, there's an angle here, 60 degrees to the vertical. Then the other student also dragging his own this way. Angle is still 60 degrees to the vertical. So, how do I know the force will go up? If my bag is going down, and I'm trying to catch this bag, I'm trying to hold it up. There's no way I can be pushing down on the bag as well. So, it wants to go down. To stop it from going down, the only way I can apply a force to stop it is by taking my force upwards. As I move my force is... Are facing up so i call this force f1 and i'll call it f2 now when it says the force on each student's hand or arm because both my angles are 60 degrees then it stands to reason that both my forces will be equal that's why if i find one force and not i'm putting for the two if not i would have had to sign the force for each of them individually and they would have had to specify which student in the question but they didn't have to because the forces are the same now i have this diagram but this is not what i need to solve I've said before 
in equilibrium we have to draw your triangle so i take let me take my f1 first my f1 is going this way now i have to take a second force and add to it for it to balance out let me show my f2 now my f2 cannot be going this way because now let me say i try to spread now from a point or remember we said in equilibrium they need to float into each other which implies that my second force f2 can instead be here you see it is coming into my diagram while last but not least obviously to complete this triangle i need it i know i need a straight line and this straight line just happens to coincide perfectly with my weight see so f1 is right here F2 going upwards is right here, and then my weight is this way. This is my weight. So I know that my weight is 162 newtons. So 162 newtons comes here. Next stop, I have to look at my angles. Between my F2 and the vertical is 60 degrees. So this is my F2, and this is the vertical, which means the angle here must be 60 degrees. Now, also, the same thing applies to my F1 and the vertical is 60 degrees. So if there was a vertical line here, here will be 60 degrees. But since I know here is vertical and here is vertical, this is what is referred to as alternate angles in mathematics. So here must be 60 degrees as well. Therefore, I know here is 60, no here is 60, and Based on my small logic again, I keep on saying physics students need to know mathematics because most times so after identifying the structure in physics, what you are basically doing is solving mass. Because right now, if I look here, here is 60, here is 60. Then by all logic, or angles in a triangle is 180. So 60 plus 60 plus that remaining angle to be 180, here must be 60 as well, which means here is 60 degrees. And if you remember in mathematics, only one type of triangle has the three angles equal. And that is the equilateral triangle. That's the only type of triangle in which the angles are equal. And when the angles are equal, the sides are also equal. Which therefore means that even without any little bit of solving at all, F1 must be 162 Newton and F2 must also be 162 Newtons. See, there was no need to solve. Now, even if I had solved by the way, please take notes, I still would have gotten my answer because they are all the same. But with this, I don't have to stress myself. My solving time is reduced into at high zero because I didn't solve anything. And I just know that instantly the answer must be option B 162 Newtons. So, please, PG students, you must have a good grasp on your mathematics this is question one i do hope you understand all we have to do is first of all draw the real body diagram based on the description in the question then create the triangle of vectors using the method we explained in which all the vectors flow into each other then once you solve your triangle you have your answer okay that leads us to our next question this time it's from the year 1994 and it is the question number 41. we have a diagram in the question directly without we think about it i'm going to draw it here so that we can all analyze together on this board um, there's a force here angle here is 30 degrees there's a downwards force of 200 newton over here then i'm told the figure above shows a uniform mode of weight 200 newton and length 50 meters. Weight is 200 newton and length is 50 meters. It is pivoted at one end and suspended by a cord at an angle of 30 degrees to the wood. Calculate the tension in the cord if the wood is horizontal. Now, um, at this point in time, I will have to do a small bit of deviation and explain one more concept to you. 
This is a very important concept which I neglected to explain in the previous part. And this is a concept known as center of gravity. Now, what is center of gravity? Center of gravity is a point on the body through which the line of action of the body, of the weight of the body rather, always acts irrespective of the position of the body. The point on the body through which the line of action of the weight of that body will always act no matter the position of that body. Um, a good way to imagine this is if you've ever played with a book before, a notebook, and try to raise it up with just one finger. You notice you cannot just put that finger anywhere on that book and hold it up. No, but there's a certain point around the middle of the book, you put your finger and you're able to actually hold this book perfectly with only one finger, the book doesn't fall or turn. Why is that? Because your finger is at the center of gravity. So typically, the center of gravity is where it exists at the point where the line of axis of symmetry meets. And obviously, your books are rectangular, so it is at the middle. And okay, but we now have to look at what we refer to as uniform bodies and non uniform bodies. In this topic, at times, we deal with weightless beams. If they tell you a beam is weightless, that means you're not going to consider the weight of that beam at all. It pretends it has no mass and no weight. But if it has a weight, then it is that going to be uniform or non uniform? If this beam is uniform, then weight is going to act at the middle, at the center. But if this beam is not uniform, then they will have to tell you exactly where the weight should be acting. So if I'm having a meter rule, a meter rule so named because it's one meter long. If it is uniform, then the weight should be at a 50 centimeter mark. Because the meter is 100 cm, the weight should be at a 50 centimeters mark. If that rule was uniform, but at times it is not, so they will tell you. Once they tell you a uniform beam, you don't have to tell where the weight should be. It's at the center. If they don't tell you, then yes, you may have to find it yourself. But please note, if it is a triangle, you don't go to the center for your center of gravity instead. That one gets a little bit more complicated. Center of gravity is about at to third the height of the beam. If everything is height, this is usually at two over three of the height. If the circle is at the center. So again, it depends on the geometry of the shape. But for our purpose of our solving in this topic, we are mostly using rectangular beams. So it's usually at the middle once it's uniform. Okay, then um one last thing before I go back to my solving is for you to note, please, there are also types of equilibrium. There's what we know as stable equilibrium, unstable equilibrium, and neutral equilibrium. Now, if your body is in a stable equilibrium, it means this body comes to rest at that position and it can actually stay like that. For example, if one they will place upside down, they have an example of stable equilibrium. Now, for unstable equilibrium, it means the body cannot stay in that position. It's going to just fall. For example, if I also turn this same funnel right side up or upside down, something like this. I'm just starting with this thinner base. My funnel, my funnel will fall. Why in neutral equilibrium, the body basically finds a new equilibrium position by itself and comes to rest. For example, if I put the funnel horizontally and then I roll it, so that's the difference. In stable equilibrium, if you shift it a little bit, it comes back to that equilibrium position. Shake, it will always fall back this way, sometimes it push just a bit. In unstable equilibrium, once you shift it a little bit, the full system goes down. It can no longer come back to this way once it shakes a bit. While in unstable equilibrium, it simply goes and finds a new equilibrium position. If I also turn this a bit, it spin rolls, and then stops eventually still in that position. Is that okay? So now, using that logic of uniform beam cycle length, I'm going to come back here and remember, since they said that this should be a uniform beam, then I must know that my weight must be at the middle, which is 25 meters. Then, next up, you remember we said for moment, 
moment is usually false and perpendicular distance. However, in this case, my force is at an angle. Therefore, the only part of this force that I'm going to be dealing with is the one facing up that perpendicular aspect. So, if I was to go back to my question, my question wants me to find the tension in the cord. So, the plan that when I solve, I should actually get this vertical force first. Once I get the vertical force, I can then see what the tension should be. So, how do I start? Now, remember, for moments, we said two things must happen, right? The moments must be equal and the forces must be equal. Now, there's a force here, obviously. There's a reaction here. This is trying to cool down. So there's a normal reaction there, which I can replace and put this as reaction. Therefore, my sum of upward forces will be um, 1 and 2 are upward. So, arrow plus Fy equals to downward force, which is 200 Newton. But if you look at this, is there anything I could possibly do here? No, there's not something to solve here. I'm going to put this on hold and call it equation 1. Next stop, to get my Fy, we then do something called taking moments about a point. Now, we want to simply ask ourselves, what happens if I'm turning this object about a point? Now, the easiest way to do this, to actually make your solving easy, is I have two unknowns here, right? The only way for me to get rid of one of the unknowns is if I was to take moment about that unknown. Because as you are aware, that will force here yeah, acting to turn something about this point. There will be no rotation. It's going to simply move it upwards. Therefore, rotation there becomes zero. So I will take moment about arrow so that arrow can go away. And I can try to guess what I want, which is what? Fy. So take moment about arrow. I should know that clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment. Now, which of this is clockwise? It gives this point. Now, which of these forces will make this thing turn like a clock? The force going up or the one coming down? Obviously, it's the one coming down. But as you can see, it's going to turn it the way your clock is moving. So that will be 200 times how far is this from 200 to this point? 25 meters equals then this way anti-clockwise moving the opposite direction of your clock that'll be fy times how far is it from here to the moment you're taking moment about 15 meters sorry um how far is it from here to the point points that are taking moment about so 200 times 25 should give me 5000 equals to 50 fy over 50, over 50, Fy equals 100 newtons. Now, um, let me just check my options to see if they tried tricking you. Yes, you see, there's 100 newtons in my options. Please, do not jump and assume you have gotten your answer. What we've gotten is the vertical component, not my final answer. So, so some of you who are always in a hurry, I may just rush and save 100. Please be careful. We are not done. Just one small thing to do. I know I have this force here and that the vertical component was 100. So if I try to resolve this force now with our normal method of length in vectors, I will know that Fy, the vertical component equals to C. If I'm going this way, mango is opening, so that should be sine theta. I know that Fy is 100. I don't know T. And this is sine 30. Then you should know that sine 30 is 1 over 2. So cross multiply t times 1, t equals 2 times 100, which is 200 newtons. So my answer is actually d. Is that okay? I hope this wasn't confusing. I speak so that d to explain to us why my 200 newton force. It's going to be at the middle, which is 25 meters mark. And that was because we are dealing with a uniform beam. Okay. And if that is understood, move on to question number three. Question three. For question three, we're going to the year 1995. 
I'm taking a look at question number six. Okay, 1995, number six on our O3 scripture map. This one says, a uniform road PQ, again, keep in mind uniform, that means the weight should be at the middle, of length one meters and mass two kg. Let's try and draw the reading. Uniform road of length one meters is PQ, you said. Let's put PQ there. Length is one meters. Okay, and mass two kg because the length is one meters. When I, my weight must be somewhere at the middle, two kg. I shall weigh weight equals to mg. So two times ten will be twenty newtons. From here to here, it will be fifty cm. Okay, let's keep that in mind and proceed. It is um, pivoted at the end p. That means it's a pivot here. P. Okay. If a load of 14 Newton is placed at the center of the road, that means at this center here again, a load of 14 Newton is placed. Find the force that should be applied vertically upwards at Q. Find the force that we can put here such that or uh, to maintain the road at equilibrium horizontally. So we have a force of 14 newton here the weight is also there we want to apply force at this end to keep this beam in equilibrium now without much ado the first thing i can simply fix here is the fact that since these two forces are acting at the same point and in the same direction they will simply combine implying that i'll be having 14 which is the weight which is the mass you are putting or the load you are putting towards the weight which is 20 and that will be 34 newton at this point and then my force is here then i'll just correct one small thing to avoid problems here is in meters here is in cm let's put them in the same unit and say that here will be 0 0.5 meters and obviously if here to here is 0 0.5 and everything is one from here to here will also be 0 0.5 meters and like we did before please note um when you have just one support and you want to find your force, there's no need to even do the force formula. You can still go straight to the moments and see clockwise moment equals anti-clockwise moment. Just like what we did before, which one of them will give the clockwise moment about P? This one will make it turn this way. So this is my anti-clockwise moment. This one will make it turn this way. So this is my clockwise moment. So that will be the force, 34, times the distance, 0 0.5, equals to, for the anticlockwise, the force is F times the distance, 1. And then F times 1 remains F. 34 times 0 0.5 with your calculator gives you 17 Newton. So that's my answer, option C. So one thing you must notice is that the greatest difficulty in this topic is why you getting the accurate diagram. If you draw the wrong diagram, the answer will be wrong. But once you have your accurate diagram, the solving is very, 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 very simple. Okay, let's move on to our fourth question. This time we are still that's why keeping the same year, 1995, but we're looking now at question number. 42 1995 number 42 we have a simple diagram i have been asked to find the value of t now i don't have to draw the diagram because you can see it right there on your screen but keeping that diagram we have to now find the proper triangle for this diagram now um let's just draw it so i can see it huh? to make it easier for me to show you what i'm dealing with here Diagram, diagram, this C, C, then uh, so that here is 30 degrees, here is 30 degrees, and um, here is 20 Newton. Now, okay, when solving, I now have a downward 20 Newton force. I can split draw it like this and say, yeah, it's 20 Newton. I'm trying to create my triangle now. If I take this T nest, 
let's draw this arrow well if i take this t nest notice this t cannot come here because then if it happens to come there then the two arrows are going to be facing each other that is not possible instead it can come here such that this arrow will flow in here and come out here and then one t can be here which is this t while this second t has to come here and continue the diagram upwards so this is a straight line so you see my two t's can simply meet and join and as you can see remember we said when you draw your triangle the arrows must flow into each other so now what is 20 this is t this is t and for most we knew between this t the one going upwards the angle here is 30 degrees which means the angle horizontally here is 30 degrees what can we do with that we know that this is vertical horizontal so this should be 90 degrees if here is 90 and here is 30 then the remainder here must be 60 degrees see very easy for this second one the angle here again is going to be 30 degrees And one more time we can say if here is 30 degrees by alternate angle theory here must be 30 degrees and just like what we did down if outside is 30 the inside must be 60. and this is one of those times where i have to say jam really likes helping us out because again if here is 30 then here must be 30 degrees alternate angles and therefore here must be 60 degrees and just like the previous example if all the angles are 60 a collateral triangle then all the sides are what again equal which implies that t must be 20 newton and that is option c so you notice i again did not need to solve my triangle simply gave me my answer by itself without much effort on my part it's not always happen that way, but when it does, we should be able to identify it and get our answer quickly. And that is that for our fourth question. Now we should go to our fifth question. This time from 1997, question number 43. Years 97, the year question is 43. We have a diagram one more time, and we have been asked to find an angle. Okay. So let's just draw the diagram again. These are necessary for our explanation. We so that you have a vertical here. Okay, this is here. There's a circle here. This is here, and this is here. We so that here is six nothing downwards. Here is six root three nothing to the right, and here is twelve nothing coming this way. It's an angle theta here. Now, before we can find that angle. What we must first do is ask ourselves, can we get the triangle of vectors or triangle of forces for this diagram? Let's start with a simple one. Take the horizontal side, C root 3. What else can I do? My 6 cannot go down from here. Because if I do that, my diagram should not be flowing to each other, they'll be separating. Instead, my 6 can be here. 6 newton which as you can see flows into it and automatically i know that this is my 12 so i can simply come here and stay here see 12 newton and once i do that notice my flow is maintained they are flowing to each other and if i look at this angle here this angle is between 12 and the vertical 12 and the vertical implying that here is theta see so right now Getting my theta becomes very, very easy. How? I know my sides and I want to find an angle. Let's, let's use sine. This is what of us the first sign is the easiest of them. We can say sine theta, as we are away from mathematics again, is opposite over hypotenuse. What's my opposite here? 6 root 3. And what's my hypotenuse? 12. So 6 root 3 over 12. 6 here 1, 6 here 
2 sine theta equals root 3 over 2 and therefore theta must be equal to the sine inverse of root 3 over 2 now you remember in your jam you do not have scientific calculator what can you do simply remember what sign of as in sign of what angle gives you root 3 over 2 these are our special angles and you must remember sine 30 is 1 over 2 sine 45 is root 2 over 2 but sine 60 is root 3 over 2 which means that my angle for theta must be 60 degrees and if i check my options that is option d so you see these are simple simple questions just get your diagram straight and you can solve pretty much any question that comes your way last question five question six again we are maintaining the year we are staying in 1997 but now we are going to question number 45 for question 45 we have a diagram of a beam going from x to z then um at the point o along this beam there's a force here at point o this force is going upwards and it is c and the angle is 30 degrees and the distance from here to here is 20 cm then um from here to on that point y on the diagram is 30 cm 30 cm this is y and we have a force here going downwards f okay what we are told is any form light beam xz is hinged at x and kept in equilibrium by the forces c and f as shown in the diagram if xo equals 20 meters and oy equals 30 centimeters I think that's why I meant 20 centimeters and 30 centimeters as it should in diagram, not meters and centimeters. Express T in terms of F. I want us to get T in terms of F. That means my answers we actually still carry letters. So what can I do? I ask myself, okay, this T is horizontal, but for a moment we require the vertical component, which is T Y. And I remember if I resolve to the vertical. T y equals to as I'm opening this angle, my angle is increasing, so that will be t sine 30. Sine 30 is 1 over 2. That's t, or as I prefer using decimal, 0.5 t. I'm seeing my solving, I'll make use of 0.5 t. Okay. Now again, to get my answer, I will simply say, okay, let's take moments about x. Taking moment about x. If I do that, there's going to be clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment. Now, which of these forces is going to give me clockwise moment? This my T Y is turning it this way, going up like this against here. That is anti-clockwise, opposite your clock. Why my F is going this way? turning it in the direction of my clock. So my F will give me the clockwise moment and T will give me anti-clockwise. So for clockwise, that will be F times, how far is it? 30 plus 20 is 50. Why for my TY, it will be the value of TY, which is 0.5 T times, how far is it? 20 CM. So remember, the question wants you to find t in terms of f i should be having t equals to something let's see f times 50 is 50 f then 0 0.5 times 20 is 10 t so to make t stand alone over 10 over 10 t equals to 0 cancel 0 5 f and if i look at that that is simply option d so I do hope we are getting this. For the ones with moments, just remember, clockwise moment equals to anti-clockwise moment. Why for 
the ones with point bodies simply draw your triangle of forces okay because of the diagrams i'm having to solve with the board like this rather than devising it as usual okay we are going to the year 1998 now that's 98 and this is question number eight it says a uniform meter rule a uniform meter rule let's draw the meter rule and i thought it is uniform implying the weight to be at the middle uniform meter rule weighing 0 0.5 newton so which is at the middle 0 0.5 newton therefore at the middle if i know my full meter rule is one meters and this is my weight is going to be at the center which is 0 0.5 meters okay is pivoted on a knife edge at the 30 cm mark now let's say my meter rule starts from here 0 to 100 they are putting a pivot at the 30 cm mark. Let me move this from here so my diagram becomes clear. Let me put it up here. You see, here is 0 0.5 meters. Pivot is at the 30 cm mark. So going from 0 to 100, that means that my 30 cm is before I get to 50. So somewhere here, 30 cm mark. Now, that means from here to here, the rate of the pivot is 30 cm, which is 0 0.3 meters. And that means from here, so this pivot is going to be 20 cm, which is 0 0.2 meters. I know some of you may be looking at that and saying, that doesn't look like 30, or why is 0 0.2 bigger than 0 0.3? I drew this anyhow because I'm drawing for jump. If this is why, while they may not grade you, or expect you to measure it, it makes more sense for your solving on um, your analysis if your dimensions kind of make sense. Right now, in Jambi, you're usually in a hurry. You don't have time for those. So you just draw the way you can and try and continue. So in this case, we have been asked, where will the force of tumulting be placed from the pivot to balance the meter rule? Now, so this weight is this way. Where along this meter rule can I put another force that will balance it? And the force is to be tumulting. Now, there's a bit of common sense. If I put my force here, there is no way on God's green earth it's going to balance. I already have my weight on the right hand side. If I put on that force on the right hand side, there is no way this thing will balance because two downward forces on the right is always going to make it turn. To make it balance instead, I need to have the force somewhere on this side. That's the only way. I'm going to have one force on the right, one on the left, balancing it. That's the simple logic we must get down first. If I also put it anywhere on the right, I'll be wrong. So that tells me it must be on this side. Therefore, if I call the distance from here to here x, and I know this is a 2 newton force, then I can say 2 times x equals to the force here, 0 0.5 times the distance, 0 0.2. So 2x equals to 0 0.5 times 0 0.2. Um, let's just use calculator so I avoid mistakes here. That'll be 0 0.1. So over 2, over 2. X equals to 0 0.05 meters. But if you look at my options, they're all in centimeters. So times 100 becomes 5 cm. But please, one more time. This way, if you rush, you can easily get your answer wrong. I know that the distance. Let me, if I, let me zoom that diagram a bit. This is my pivot here. And this is my weight here. This is the 0 0.5 nothing. I'm going to forget about the rest of it now. I want, to, I want to show us something very important here. And I know that the distance from here to here is 30 cm. And here to here is 20 cm. Okay. Now I know that my force, I placed it here force here of two newton and then i made this distance x now after finding x as five does that truly mean that in my meter row from year to year is five no i simply know right now that year to year is five cm but there's still year to year to account for and i know everything should be taxi 
So if everything should be 30, then y plus 5, y must be 30 minus 5, which is 25 cm. A mass that will actually be option B. You just see where the mistake could easily come in. If you just rush, you just play wrong, and you decide to put your answer at this point here as 5, which is in the options, you'll be wrong because the spin measured 5 away from the pivot. But 5 away from the pivot is not how we measure a meter rule. The meter rule starts from 0 at this place and starts increasing. From 0 to here is 30. Why from a random point here to 30 was 5. If I go back, what should I be seeing? 25 centimeters. So my answer is actually option B. So I advise you, while dealing with this topic, at times you have to settle down and really read your question. If not, you can easily make mistakes. Okay, we we'll move on. Our next question is from the year 2000. The year is 2007, sorry, 2007. And this now is question number 45. The question states, the unit of a couple can be expressed in what? Remember, a couple is going to be force times distance. Force is in Newton, distance is in meters. So your answer is simply Newton meters, option A. Very, 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 very simple. So at times, just please note, they may ask you, what quantity has the same unit as work? That will also be coupled. Because remember, work is force times distance as well. Just that they prefer to call it joules. Why in this case, to differentiate from work, we call it Newton meters. Okay, moving on. Let's go to the year 2005 year 2005 and see on that question in this case we are giving a diagram 2005 number seven we're giving a diagram that looks somehow like this um okay so the is p here is seven here is ten and um that this angle here is 150 degrees. Now, this looks a little bit intriguing. Let's try and draw it in our triangle, our normal method. Let's take this 10 first. And then that here must be 10 or 10. What else do I know? Where can I put my P? I can take my P and put my P underneath it like this. And then my P is going to flow into it. Then, where will my 7 go? My seven can come up here and go down. Seven nothing. However, however, what can I do about the angle? What can I do about the angle? Okay, so once I have this diagram here, the next thing I have to do is find a way to actually put in these angles in my question into my in my you know my question into this diagram. Now look at this. If I continue this line here previously, I just continue that upwards, then here is 150. And what's remaining here in this angle? In a straight line, there must be 30 degrees. Now, if you look at this, this is a straight line between 7 and P. If you come over, you realize that what I simply did was like, it was almost as though I took my 7 notion and raised it up and put it here, implying therefore that this angle here must be the same as this angle here, which is 30 degrees, you see? And so we've gotten our first angle. Now, is there any other angle to be considered here? Looking closely at this question, I can see that from the diagram, the angle between this 10 and 7 should be 90. Now, ideally, they should truly specify this for you. But if I look at clearly at my diagram, I'm actually able to tell that that should be 90 degrees, meaning between 7 and 10, 7 and 10, the angle should be 90. The get what my diagram will look like. I now know that there should be 90. So I could simply apply your Pythagoras theory. That if I redraw this in a way that we can see it clearly now, this is here. This should be more like this and more like this. So that we know here is 90 degrees. Here is 30 degrees, 
this is the seven noting force this is p and this is the 10 looking force now this looks more like a right angle triangle so this is my hypotenuse based on my angle this is my opposite and my adjacent so what i actually want to find is the value of p which is this here okay yeah so as i was saying i want to find this guy here I could simply make use of Pythagoras theory to do so, or so Cartois preferably. Here is 30 degrees, here is 10, the so angle opposite hypotenuse. And I will know that sine 30 equals to the opposite 10 over the hypotenuse P. Sine 30 is 1 over 2. This is equals to 10 over P. Cross multiply P times 1. P is equal to 2 times 10, which is 20 Newton. So as you can see again, it all truly depends on your diagram. Once you obtain your diagram, your solving becomes actually very, very easy. Okay, so let's take a look at try one last question. And that is equilibrium of forces. And we shall try to call it a day on this topic so our last example comes from 2003 question 11. in this case a 90 centimeters uniform lever which means i'm drawing again but instead of one meters this is 90 centimeters uniform lever which means the weight is at the middle so a 90 centimeters uniform lever has a load of 30 newton suspended at 15 cm from one of its ends let's identify the ends let's call it the zero end let's call it the 90 end so the first thing is we suspend 15 away from this end so yeah 15 cm away sorry 15 cm is here while my load is 30 newtons okay if the fulcrum is at the center of gravity Center of gravity, like we said, since it is uniform, it must be at the middle, which is the 45 cm mark, half of 90. So if here is 15, to get to 45, the extra should be 30 cm. Okay, so that's that. Then the force that must be applied at the other end, this is the other end, force that must be applied here, to keep it in horizontal equilibrium, must be what? So this is it basically if here is 45 i know that from here to the end it should also be under 45 cm and quite simply clockwise moment equals anti-clockwise moment what's the force here 30 what's the distance to the pivot 30 then the force here is f while the distance is 45 30 times 30 900 45 times f 45f over 45 over 45 f equals to 9 over 45 which is 20 newton and as you can see that is my answer so yes this is our final answer 20 newton that's option b and with that we've come to an end of this class on equilibrium of forces thank you very much for watching this video remember o3 schools jam app that's your sure assurance for getting good grades in your utme examination so please um like and subscribe to this channel for more videos on more tutorials and uh, my name is atanasius thank you very much for watching